yeah, so obviously the title of the session is Can You Model That? And I want to talk about can you analyze that and show you a method that I, me and my colleagues have um, used on an existing model for the origins of agriculture. So first of all, the origins of agriculture, I'm sure you all know, is a major event in human history. Um, but why did we make the transition? It's not that obvious because um, for those first farmers that were switching to agriculture, there's evidence of a health decline, um, worse productivity, um, an increase in infection and disease, um, and more work effort. So it's really not obvious what was going on around that time when people were switching to farming from hunting and gathering. Um, but there's lots of theories, amongst them are climate, population, and social pressures. But perhaps it's a mixture of these um, theories and there's no single explanation. And this is where computational modeling can come in handy because we're dealing with lots of factors and it's quite a complex issue. Um, so it turns out there's quite a lot of agent-based models or just computational models for the origins of agriculture. Um, but first of all, why model? Um, so as I said, um, when there's multiple factors interacting, our intuitions can fail us. Um, and models allow us to sharpen intuitions, especially on the behavior of complex systems. Um, they can also allow us to estimate parameter values by um, if we have observed data. And this is kind of the approaches of, of approximate Bayesian computation um, and full likelihood or other Bayesian approaches. So obviously models need to be analyzed properly. Um, but they're often stochastic and have parameters which are hard to find exact values for. And we all know this from archaeology. So it can make it really hard for the analysis. So in this talk, I'm going to um, illustrate some of the problems with a really simple model example to uh, introduce our analysis method. And then I'm going to show you um, an existing model for the origins of agriculture by Bowles and Choi. And this is from 2013. And then I'm going to show you how we use our analysis method on their model and the conclusions. So first of all, so here is a stochastic simulation model. And I'm not going to tell you anything about the model. It <laughs> is a black box. But what goes into it are some parameters. And I'm going to say they're the fertility and movement rate. And out of it comes a model result. And in this case, it's going to be the population density after 10 years. So we're going to run the model, and we get a result. But because it's stochastic, we're getting a different result every time. So I run it five times. I get the um, frequency of the results. I run it 20 times. I run it 1,000 times. And I start to see a consistent result then. Um, obviously, all models are different in their stochasticity, so you might not have to do it a thousand times, but you may have to. Um, and because of the law of large numbers, this um, if you run it another thousand times, you should be getting a distribution which is close to this one. And then from this, you might get a statistic, say the mean, and that could be your result. So you might say, okay, the model's predicting that there should be 100 people per kilometer squared after 10 years. But then you realize that actually your parameters, you don't know the exact values for. So I say the fertility rate is two births per woman, but actually maybe it's like 2.1 or 2.2. So the standard approach is to vary them and run the model and see what difference it makes while fixing the rest of them at the same value. So you usually do that a few times. And that's the general parameter sensitivity approach. Um, but also, your other parameters you might not know the exact values for. So keeping the rest of them set to their default value when you can't really justify that default value is a bit tricky. So I think we really should be permuting all of these different combinations and running the models and seeing the difference it makes. Um, but obviously, our models have a lot more than two parameters. So we're dealing with like something really complicated. We've got all these permutations and different results, um, and it becomes really tricky. Um, so an approach which is um, popular in um, genetics 
at least, for modeling, is approximate Bayesian computation. And this is where you have a real-life result from data, um, and you use it to infer what the parameters might be, or at least ballpark values for what they could be. Um, so you're going to run the simulations many times with lots of permutations of your parameters, and compare it to the real-life result, and see which of those parameter values gives the best um, uh, result. And again, in archaeology, having this real-life result with like a high definition of um, uh, accuracy is also difficult. So the, uh, the way we did it was we used an approach called fitting to idealized outcomes. And this is where, instead of having uh, good resolution data for the idealized outcome, we just have like an idea. So, for example, here we're going to say it's going to be, we want the population density to be at its maximum. So this is kind of just like a broad result. So, um, so for example, if you were modeling out of Africa, your broad result might be they get out of Africa. Um, okay, so that's the motivation. So now I'm going to talk about um, Bowles and Choi's model for the origins of agriculture. So, their model is agent-based and game-theoretical, and it uh, models the emergence of farming and farming-friendly property rights. And it's calibrated with a measure of climate volatility. Um, it's made up of 600 agents, and these are divided into 30 groups. So each of the groups is 20 agents. Um, and it's run for 41 and a half thousand years. And the agents have three properties. One is their payoff, which is basically how much food they have. The other is their technology strategy, which is whether they foraged or farmed for that food. And the third is their behavioral strategy, which is how they decide to share that food with one another. So they can be, or not share that food with one another. So they can be a sharer, a bourgeois, or a civic. Um, so their model is um, roughly split into five steps. The first is obtaining that food from farming or hunter-gathering. The second is the distribution game, which is where they share that food with one another or not share. The third is cultural updating, which is where they copy strategies from the most successful. So perhaps if your cultural model is really fit and it's a farmer, but you're a forager, you might decide to switch to farming. Um, and then there's experimentation, which is just random mutation of your two strategies. So if you're a civic farmer, you might become a bourgeois forager just randomly. Uh, and then there's migration. So you might, according to a certain rate, migrate into a different group. So um, a big part of the model is in this distribution game, which is the game theory side of it, obviously. So I'll just describe some of this. Um, so here we have two agents, and they both have a bit of food. And they're going to share this food according to um, whether they're a bourgeois, civic, or sharer. So if they're both either civic or sh um, sharer or civics, then they just share that food with one another. If one of them is a bourgeois and the other is a sharer forager, then the bourgeois likes to steal food and the sharer doesn't put up a fight, so the bourgeois gets to take its, its food. And the bourgeois isn't into sharing. Sharer won't fight for that. Bourgeois gets to keep its apple. However, if the sharer is a farmer, the bourgeois respects the fact that that food is farmed and doesn't try to steal it. Um, but the sharer is still happy to share, so they share it. And like before, the bourgeois keeps its own apple. So the key thing here is that bourgeois respect farm property. And if the bourgeois is interacting with a civic farmer, again, it doesn't try to steal and the civic's happy to share. But when the bourgeois says, no, I'm keeping all my apple, the civic farmer really doesn't like that and there's a contest over the apple. And the key thing is that civics are sharer enforcers. Um, and in a similar way, when the civic is a forager, the bourgeois doesn't respect the food, tries to steal it, 
The civic doesn't like that, so there's a fight over the civic's food, and like before, a fight over the bourgeois' food. So in summary, bourgeois have farming-friendly property rights, and they'll only try to steal foraged food. Share is share, and they don't put up a fight. Civics are sharer enforcers, and they gang up on the bourgeois if they aren't sharing. And initially in the model, every agent is a civic forager, which is supposed to reflect the late Pleistocene state where people were egalitarian hunter-gatherers. So they ran their model, and they get a result. So the black wiggly line is um, the climate volatility data, and the grey lines are basically how much um, bourgeois for farming there is. So this is the farming with farming-friendly property rights. And on the x-axis, there's some of the key events um, from the archaeological record, amongst them when agriculture began in the Fertile Crescent. So what they see is when agriculture began in the Fertile Crescent, they get a steady increase in farming and farming-friendly property rights. So that sounds pretty good. However, um, when you look at their justification for parameter values, it's either non-existent or very weak. Um, and they do do a bit of parameter sensitivity analysis, but again, it's not very thorough. So I'm going to show you how we've used our analysis method on their model um, next. So what we did was um, run their model 12 million times, and each time we ran it, we chose different values for 11 of their parameter values. Um, and we chose our idealized outcome, this is the vague kind of thing we're looking for, as that the number of farmers is at its maximum at 9,000 years ago. So this is where agriculture should have become established in the Near East. And we asked two questions. Which of the simulations generate this idealized outcome, or close to it? And are there any patterns to the parameter values chosen in these top simulations? So this is what our data looks like. Um, our, the columns are the parameter values, and each row is a run of the model. So there's 12 million of those rows. Um, and down here, so we, we randomly choose the 11 parameter values, and then we get a, um, when we run it, we get the number of farmers 9,000 years ago. Um, so the last of the rows here has 591 out of 600 agents being farmers. So this might be one of the simulations that would be like a top one. Um, so we did a lot of analysis on the distributions of these values in the top simulations, but, and also all of them, um, and looked at the correlations between them um, and other various statistics. Um, so there was a lot that went into it, but I'm just going to describe some of the key results to it. Um, one of which was for the parameter, which was group size. And this graph shows um, a dot for each of the 12 million simulations, and what was the parameter value for group size that went into it, and how many numbers of farmers it generated. So as you can see, when there's a majority of farmers, um, the group size is always small. And then we just um, plotted the frequencies of those, um, the top slices of this distribution, just to make it a bit clearer. And again, we see groups are quite small, but actually not as small as they could be for farming to develop. So we have graphs like this for all of the 11 parameters. Um, I'm just going to show you five. So there's group size. There's also behavioral experimentation rate, which was the, um, the mutation rate, um, how often they just randomly switch between different strategies. And for farming to develop, we found that this should be really low. But obviously, it can't be zero, because they all start out as foragers. So you need there to be some mutation. Otherwise, they'd all be foragers. Um, another result was. Um, varying the probability a bourgeois fights for a farmed product. And if you remember, 
um, in the original model, they, um, they, they never fight for a farm product because they respect it. But we, we relaxed that assumption and allowed it to vary between zero and one. But indeed, we did find that for farming to develop, it's good to have farming-friendly property rights. Um, and the next two results are also quite obvious, that for farming to develop, the productivity of foraging should be low, and the productivity of farming should be high. Um, we also had a look at, so for the two productivities, we also plotted all of the 12 million um, simulations and the ratio between them. And actually what you see is for there to be a majority of um, farmers, this ratio can be, neg can be negative. Um, no, sorry, less. Yeah, negative. Um, so the productivity of farming can actually be lower than that of foraging. So other results, um, as I said, Bowles and Troy did do some robust, robustness checks, um, which was this fix all but one variation. Um, but we see some different results to theirs. So one of them was for migration rate. So they found increasing this led to an increase in the number of farmers. Um, but when we varied it from zero to one, we actually found that um, it didn't have an effect overall. Um, so this would be something perhaps you want to investigate further, the effect of migration on, on farming. Um, so in conclusion, uh, under their model, we predict farming is likely to emerge if groups are small. People only switch between foraging and farming very rarely. Um, there are farming-friendly property rights. Also, it's adv advantageous for the productivity of farming to be greater than foraging, but not necessary. So in summary, to kind of sell this method to you, um, we replicated someone else's work, which is always a good thing to do. Um, we've validated it a, li a little bit more because we ran it so many more times than they did. Um, and we now have new inferences on which factors might have been important or not in the origins of agriculture. And for these important factors, we have some specific values for which the parameters might have been. Um, and it illustrates how the fix all but one parameter variation approach can fail in certain circumstances. So thanks for listening. Um, this work is published last year along with the co-authors Mark Thomas and Stephen Shannon from UCL.